Hey, Olive, Arlo, and Frank. Grandpa coming to you from the living room in rainy Jacksonville Beach. It's kind of cold here, which means up where you are, Arlo, and especially where you are, Frank, it's, um, it's very cold. Cold here is like in the 50s. Eventually, it can get into the 40s, and maybe once a year it gets into the 30s, but there's some uh, bad weather up north. Olive, I'm sure you're fine. Grandmother and I talked to you today, and you're safe and sound in the house in New Orleans. <clears throat> Frank, hopefully, I don't know if you're indoors, but hopefully you can get indoors and stay indoors while this is uh, hitting the area. You'll be in my prayers. So today we're going to continue in the book of Matthew. We're going to start three chapters, five, six, and seven, that, that are called the Sermon on the Mount. Now, when we get back into the Old Testament, we're going to start to look at the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, Moses goes up a mountain, <clears throat> Mount Sinai. Hold on. <clears throat> My voice is starting to give way. Hopefully, I can get through this. He goes up Mount Sinai, and God gives him the law. He gives him the Ten Commandments. And then he comes down and gives them to the people. In this, it says that Jesus goes up a mountain, and it's it's not really a mountain. I've been to the place that they think the Sermon on the Mount happened, and, and it's certainly not a mountain. There are mountains near it, but it's like a hill, up a hill. It's a natural amphitheater, so he can talk to a whole bunch of people, and they can hear him. So... Moses got the law, the Old Testament, and gave it to the children of Israel. But Jesus is bringing a new law for the entire world. And he's going to lay that out in chapters 5, 6, and 7. So the first part of this are the Beatitudes, and they're the blessings. And in, in um, I think it's the book of Deuteronomy, Moses lists some blessings that the children of Israel will get if they obey God and some cursings that they will get if they disobey God. But this is just the blessings. As, as a Christian, we get blessings. Now, I'm not saying that you don't have to do anything. You do. But the default is blessings. So chapter 5, verse 1 says, He saw the crowds. When he saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. After he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to teach them. And, and the them could mean everybody or just the disciples. teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, and that the meek are humble, they're not proud, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. And I'm going to try not to put a lot of me in here, although I want to at the end of each one of these lines. I want to do like a one-hour study on each of them, but I'm not going to. My advice to you is read this a bunch of times, these three chapters. And you decide what you believe. Pray. Ask God to, to enlighten you. 
to, to guide you through it. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. And I've tried in my life to always be a peacemaker, not a war maker, a peacemaker. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil things about you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad because your reward is great in heaven. For they persecuted the prophets before you in the same way. So because of that line, I believe that he's just preaching to the, to the choir here. He's, he's preaching to his disciples. But it's, it's not just the 12 apostles. He had other disciples. So this is all the people that are interested, that want to hear what Jesus has to say. They're hearing it. So now we, we, he's given the new law, and, and that's based on the law, which was given by Moses, the books written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus. Um, <laughs> there's five of them, I just, it, um, the, 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 the. numbers. Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers. And then you have the prophets. That's the rest of the Old Testament. So Jesus is going to talk about the fulfillment of that. Like the law was given, so how come he's not up there saying, obey the law? We've, we've, the law has been written down. You have the Old Testament there. And there was no such thing as the Old Testament then. It was the, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible. You have the Bible. <clears throat> Do what it says. So he says this. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish these things, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke of a letter will pass from the law until everything takes place. So anyone who breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever obeys them and teaches others to do so will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness goes beyond that of the experts in the law, and that's we're talking about the, the, the upper class, like the priests, the, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, these people who were very devout. Well, the Sadducees, not so much, but... The, the priests and, and, the, and the Pharisees, very devout, but not so much following this law. They were following their own law. He says, for, for I tell you, unless your righteousness goes beyond that of the experts in the law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So now we're going to talk about anger management. We're going to talk about treating fellow human beings. Let's see what Jesus has to say about this. You have heard that it was said to an older generation, do not murder. Oh, yeah, it's, it's in the law. It's, it's in, that's in the law that Moses brought down, the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. 
and whoever murders will be subjected to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with a brother will be subjected to judgment. So even if you want to murder the guy, it's the same as if you murdered him. Now, don't go crazy about that because you're forgiven, but you shouldn't want to murder somebody. So the, the thing is, like we think as Christians, oh, well, we're saved by faith, so once we believe, you know, we have the burden of the law off of us, and, and we do have that burden off of us. But what Jesus is saying is, when you look in at yourself, the burden is even more than the law. Like the law says don't kill people. I'm telling you that if you're angry with them, that you want to do damage to them, you need to check your horses. You need to slow your roll. You need to look at yourself. You need to get right. And whoever insults a brother will, will be brought before the council. And whoever says, fool, will be sent to fiery hell. Oh, it's time for me to put my bread in. And I'll do that as soon as I'm done here. So then, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother, and then come and present your gift. Reach agreement quickly with your accuser while on the way to court, or he may hand you over to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the warden, and you will be thrown into prison. I tell you the truth, you will never get out of there until you have paid the last penny. So judgment is a uh, slippery slope. If you subject yourself to judgment, then you're going to pay the price. So next we're going to look at adultery. You have heard that it was said to not commit adultery. Once again, that's from the Ten Commandments. But I say to you that whoever looks at a woman to desire her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin... Tear it out and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better to lose one of your members than to have your whole body go into hell. That begs the question. Is Jesus telling you, like, if you, if you are sinning by looking at a woman and going like, ooh, she looks good. You should take your eye out. And people have done that. It's a real shame, because he's not saying that. He's saying, you know what? You need to deal with the fact that you're not satisfied with your own wife, that you're looking at somebody else's wife. So the first step in committing adultery is to look at another woman and go, hmm. I like her better than what I have. So what he's saying is nip it in the bud there. Because if you get to the point where your eye, looking at it, made you take the next step and commit adultery, then you'd be better off with your eye plucked out but he's definitely not saying to, to pluck it out. And divorce. It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a legal document. And that was, that was in the law. You have to divorce her. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for immorality, you, you can divorce her if, if she commits adultery against you or something. Whoever does that makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. It's real simple. If, if you got married, the assumption is 
you with the woman God wants you to be with, especially if you have children. You need to stay with her. Now, if she cheats on you, yeah, you can get a divorce. But you shouldn't get a divorce just because, like, oh, we're incompatible. She doesn't understand me. She hates it when I play video games. Next, we're going to look at oaths. And oaths are um, making promises, basically. Again, you have heard it said to an older generation, do not break an oath, but fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, do not take oaths at all, not by heaven, because it is the throne of God, not by earth, because it is his footstool, and not by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. Do not take an oath by your head, because you were not able to make one hair white or black. This was before they had hair dye. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. More than this is from the evil one, and that's Satan. So, like, don't make promises. Just keep your word. You know, there was a song by Tim Harden called Don't make promises you can't keep. Okay, next we're going to look at retaliation. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And I think that's in the book of Leviticus, I'm not sure. But I say to you, do not resist the evildoer. But whoever strikes you on the right cheek, cheek, turn the other to him as well. And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your coat also. So the tunic is like your, it's your regular garment. So for me, I have a t-shirt and pants on. But somebody from the Roman Empire at this point in time would have this tunic on, which is kind of, it's made out of cotton, like a sheet. And it's draped over on you. It's sort of like a man dress. And, and he's talking to all men. And these followers were, most of them were men. There are some women that, that follow him, and we'll, we'll get into their lives in detail. I'm not demeaning the women involved in, in the following of Jesus, but this right here, he's talking to men. Women wore tunics, too. So... And then when it was cold, and it gets cold in, in places like Jerusalem and, and where Jesus lives. He's by the, the side of, of, the, of the Sea of Galilee, Lake Tiberias. Let him have your coat also. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you, and do not reject the one who wants to borrow from you. So you're supposed to give to people. That's not saying that if you're walking down the street and some guy comes up to you and goes like, hey, man, give me $20, that you're supposed to give it to them. But you're supposed to, as a Christian, you're, you're supposed to give, not take. And, and at that point in time, when they're talking about somebody asking you to go a mile and you go too, as subjects of the Romans, if a Roman soldier came up to you and said, hey, my implements of war, my shield and my, and my spear or sword, whatever it was, I'm tired of carrying them. I need you to carry them for me. They had that obligation, the, the subjects of the Roman emperor, an obligation to do that and they could ask you to go up to a whole mile and carry their stuff and you couldn't say no you broke the law if you said no well he's saying you know what do twice as much why because people don't expect it the stuff that Jesus is talking about nobody expects nobody expects this 
And, and when they see it, they go, oh, wow, you're different. And some of them go, I want what you have. And that's your job as a Christian. So let's um, come home with it. Verse 43 says, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. It's very hard, but you should do that. So that you you may be like your Father in heaven, since he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even the tax collectors, and it's funny because I used to be a tax collector. Grandmother was too. For over 20 years, we were tax collectors for the IRS. And <laughs> So we're going to see as Jesus builds his little Murray band that he's got tax collectors. He's got at least one tax collector there, and then there's other stories that involve, that involve tax collectors. For even the tax collectors do the same, don't they? And if you only greet your brothers, what more do you do? Even the Gentiles do the same, don't they? So then be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And trust me, you'll never be perfect. Jesus knows that. And God knows that. But you can try. You can try to be the person that he's talking about in this chapter. See you next time, kiddies. Peace out.